Welcome to the Effortless English Show with the world's number one English teacher, AJ Hogue, where AJ's more than 40 million students worldwide finally learn English once and for all without the boring textbooks, classrooms, and grammar drills. Here's AJ with a quick piece to help you learn to speak fluent English effortlessly. Hi, I'm AJ Hogue, the author of Effortless English, Learn to Speak English Like a Native. And the father of the effortless English system that trains you to speak English fluently, speak English confidently. You speak English powerfully. You think in English. You speak English effortlessly. When you commit to my VIP program, at EffortlessEnglishClub.com Go there and commit. Commit, commit, commit to my VIP program at EffortlessEnglishClub.com EffortlessEnglishClub.com Well, I'm back home. I'm back home. That's good news, I guess. It's good news because I'm back home and I have my good internet connection this weekend. I can do our next live show, continuing our book club video. So that's good. I'll be doing more shows again. Back to my normal schedule. So that's the good news. The bad news, only bad news for me, (laughs) is that uh, I've been on a tropical island. We went to Guam the tropical island of Guam, which is in the uh, South Pacific. It's, uh, I guess the nearest country is the Philippines, probably. South of Japan and east of the Philippines. Little small island of Guam. Guam is an American territory. Anyway, we went to Guam for a couple of weeks. Ah, oh, just a nice vacation. Just, uh, what did I do? Not much, honestly. <laughs> I, let's see, we went to the beach. We swam in the ocean. We snorkeled and looked at the fish. I don't know, went for some walks. I did some exercise. That's about it, really. Not much. It was, it was just, you know, it was a real vacation. Just go and... Relax, 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 and enjoy the sun and the warm water and the warm weather. A break from winter. But today we come back and it's right into winter. It's it's not super cold here, but it's a cold, rainy day in Japan, in Osaka, Japan, with uh, kind of, you know gray skies, clouds, and kind of a medium rain coming down. Not not super heavy, but not more than sprinkling. Sprinkling, we say sprinkling in English, is when you have kind of a very light rain. Pouring is a very heavy rain. Pouring, we say, ah, oh, it's pouring outside. It's raining very, very heavy. Well, um, tonight here in Osaka is kind of in the middle of that. Uh, I guess we just call it a a, a light rain or a, a medium rain. So anyway, back to the cold and the rain. Oh, but at least I get to come back and talk to you. Get back on the podcast. Get back on the show. Start doing more shows again, more podcasts. So that's good. People. So I've been thinking about the the book, of course. You know, each time we have a book, I think about it a lot. You know, I'd like to try to go deeply into the book. And you know, I think sometimes maybe I'm I'm ev- I'm going even beyond the book, right? So maybe the books that we do, uh, I'll find some ideas in them, some messages in them. But then I'll kind of go farther. You know, I'll start thinking beyond that. It leads me to other thoughts to other meanings, to other ideas. And I think I'm really doing that with this Stephen Covey book because 
you know, his that that introduction that talks so much about you know virtue and virtues and the importance of character. It's, it's my favorite part of the book. I realize now, which is why I've been talking about this topic so much. You know, but really, I'm going. I'm going beyond the book because Stephen Covey does does not talk about it in such detail like I am. But, uh, you know, honestly, I think that's the most powerful part of the book. The rest of the book is very useful, definitely. Each of his rules are very practical, very useful, very good for, you know, having to, an effective life, right? And that means getting what you want from life. You know, achieving your goals, both kinds of goals, you know, the the kind of success goals, but also the fulfillment goals, you know, f- feeling good, having a happy life. But really, I think, you know, the, 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 the habits he's teaching us, so he's teaching us seven habits. We'll learn number four this weekend. But really, they all re- go back to that first introduction, I believe, back to those virtues, back to the the main mindset, the main attitude, the main idea of focusing on the inside, on what's deep, on what's true, on what's real and good. That's important because really that goes against almost the entire modern world, which is the exact opposite of that. And the fake schools and the fake media really everywhere, even most self-help books you read, it's, it's quite the opposite. It's a big, big, big focus on the performance skills and, you know, things like virtue, honor, truth. I don't see people talking about those things very much. Not in schools, not in the media, not in self-help books. It's all about tricks and hacks, what people call hacks. It's a kind of a slang word, H-A-C-K. A A hack or or hacks is, of course, more than one. A hack is kind of like a trick. A trick. It's a shortcut. It's It's a fast way to get a result. A hack. So that's kind of the mindset now, the popular mindset about self help about um, life, really. How can you get the most in the fastest time and it doesn't matter what you really are on the inside? That's People don't say it exactly like that, but that's really what our modern cultures around the world are teaching us, this kind of globalist culture. That's what they're pushing. The opposite of virtue. The opposite of that Foundation, that big main idea of Stephen Covey's book, that virtue, right, that honorable virtue of who you really are deep inside is the most important thing. Everything else comes out of that. So you must focus on that most of all. Another idea I've been thinking about connected to this is I'd say it's another modern uh, and by modern really I'd say the last I don't know 200 or more years maybe this may actually maybe even older than that this may be just a general human nature problem or mistake and that's this oftentimes we as people we forget we get lost We forget what's important, right? We get our priorities mixed. We forget what's most important, what's truly most important. So we'll focus on something that's less important. We'll put something that's less important at the top. And that causes us to neglect, to forget about, to not take care of what's most important. And the, the, the main example of this, I think, for humans, maybe this is... Actually, you know, I think I could probably find examples of this from most of human history. So this may be a general human nature problem. 
in fact, it's a problem that certainly that Buddhism has uh, taught about for thousands of years. The problem is this. We get too focused on symbols and words and systems. We start to think they're real. We start to believe that ideas and symbols, like meaning words, and systems, you know, rules, organizations, that kind of thing. We start to believe those things are real. But they're not. They exist only in our minds. But what happens is we start to put those things above. We, we become focused on these symbols or these systems or these organizations. We become loyal to them. We serve them. Forgetting that it's people that are most important, right? These systems are supposed to serve and help people. Which people? Your people. So, for example, let's say you have a... Um, well, I'll give you a good, uh, an easy example. Let's say you have a business. You have a business. And in your business, you make policies. You make rules, right? For your organization. How do you want everybody to act? How do you want them to do things? So you'll have all these policies or rules for your employees, you know, about everything. All these different rules. And maybe when you make the rules at first, starting out with your business, maybe they're actually, they're, they're useful. Pro usually in the beginning, we understand that, okay, we, ha we have some problems in the business, so we need some systems, we need rules, so we, everybody knows what to do in different situations. Right? And this will help our business be better. This will help us have better customer service, for example. Take care of our customers more. It will help us make better products. It will help us make more money. You know, all the things businesses need to do. But what happens, and this is very, very, very common. I'd say almost all businesses, this happens as they grow, especially when they grow. Something happens where... Eventually, the system, the rules, right? The corporation and all the policies and the rules and the procedures and the paperwork becomes the most important thing. They forget about the real purpose. And so this is why when you, it's so frustrating sometimes when you have a problem with a big company, right? Because you go to their customer service and they don't help you, right? And they, why? Because they have all these rules they must follow. They have all this paperwork they must do. They have to call their boss. Their boss has to talk to somebody else. It takes forever. It takes a long, long, long time. They make you wait. They make you argue. Or they say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't help you because, you know, our rules say that I can't help you. Even when they're wrong, even when they should help you. Even when it's stupid, when it's bad customer service, when they are going to lose you as a customer. Maybe you're a very good customer. But just because of their stupid rules, their company rules, they don't do the right thing. The customer service gets worse. They worship the rules. They make the rules, the system, most important. And the real purpose, what's really important, the customers, the real people that buy the products, they become less important. Th this is, I think this happens, any very large company I can think of, this, this seems like it's always the case. This, this always happens. Another great example of this is government. I mean, governments are famous for... They don't serve the people. They hurt the people. They, they treat the people badly, right? There's a, we, we, we create a government, any government. It doesn't matter if it's a king or a democracy or something else. But the government is supposed to serve the people, right? That's, the people are supposed to be number one. The real people of the country, of the nation. That's what's important. But then what happens? It's the system of the government, the constitution, the laws, the bureaucracy, 
all of that grows bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger. And then people actually start to think that it's the government system that's most important. It doesn't matter if the government system is now hurting the people. And so people will say, oh, democracy, democracy is so important. No, no, it's not. It's not important. What's important is that the nation, the people of the country are free and happy. Now, democracy might be good, but I'd say now around the world, most democracies do the opposite. They are super corrupt and they're hurting the people. Now, unfortunately, so are other kinds of government. <laughs> They're usually also hurting the people. So I don't know what the answer is, but I think the an- part of the problem is the answer is not a system. It's not just some system because the system's not important. That's just a bunch of laws and rules and things. But if the people are bad, if the people in the government are bad, they don't care. And if the people in the government, if they're not focused on helping the country, really, truly trying to do the best for everyone in the country, then it doesn't matter what the system is because it's still going to be a bad government. It's going to fail. Just like in these companies, right? The employees become kind of separated from the true purpose, the people, the customers, the customers. The customers should be the focus, the number one total complete focus of any business. But as the business gets bigger, they almost become annoyed by the customers. They don't want to deal with you. Right? It's kind of strange. So people first. People first. When we were um, reading Animal Farm, we saw this, right? What happened? How did, they, how did the pigs get so much control? They got the animals. In the beginning, the animals had a nice idea, right? They were focused on, you know, the, the creatures. The, they were focused on each other. They wanted a new system to, that was going to make them happier, to give them a better life, a better life for all the animals. That's what they wanted, But then the pigs created this, you know, Marxist communist system with these different rules. And of course, the rules started to change. And eventually, the animals just focused on the system and worshiping the system and following the system. And they forgot about the original purpose, which was a good, happy life for all of them. And, of course, they they ended up having a horrible, horrible life. Schools are this way. Schools. You know, what's amazing about schools, of course, school, what's the purpose? Education. And if you really think about it, like, what would you want? What would you want for... Your child, really any child, right? What would you want for for any child in terms of education? Well, you want them to grow up, to to have what they need, to grow up, to have a a, a happy life, um, you know, comfortable, meaning, you know, they they have, they they can get food and shelter and all of that, but but also, you know, to be happy, right? To have good relationships, to be able to have a good family of their own and raise good children and take care of their families, to be part of a community, to be able to think well, to you know, have good thinking abilities and skills, to be independent and interdependent both, right? And you, you could probably think of many other things you would want from that education. Well, our schools don't do any of that. And you know what's crazy about the schools, these fake schools, is that everywhere around the world, these fake schools, everybody knows they're bad. And by that, I mean the students know, the students definitely know (laughs) that, that the schools suck. That's why the students are bored and stressed and frustrated. That's why so many students around the world just hate school. Even the ones that get good grades are usually bored with the school, don't like it. That's what I was like when I was young. But the thing is, you know what? The teachers also know, maybe not all of them, but many, many, many 
maybe even most of the teachers also know that this system sucks. Meaning that the schools are not serving the children. They're not serving the children. The schools serve the government. The schools serve the bureaucracy. The schools are not focused on how can we best educate these children. No, no, no. And the teachers know it too. And you know what? The schools also really don't serve the teachers either because usually the teachers are pretty stressed out in a lot of these schools around the world. They're also stressed out. Sometimes they're very frustrated. Sometimes they're also quite bored. A lot of really great teachers go into the school systems to teach, but then they quit after several years because they just... It's too frustrating. They're not supported by the school system. Others stay in the school system, but they gradually lose their motivation. A few, you know, they fight the best they can and do the best they can, but it's a tough fight. So again, you have it, you know, the schools, they're not serving the teachers. The, the true teachers are not being supported or helped, really. The students are not being served, right? The people are not being served. It's, so it's just the idea. It's the organization. It's all the rules and the policies and the bureaucracy. That's what is served. That's what becomes the top priority. And again, it creates a kind of hellish, terrible environment for people. I think this is another reason why people, so many people feel this loneliness, this, uh, this feeling of no purpose, of having no purpose in life. This feeling of frustration, this feeling of just kind of being lost in their life, so, like something's missing. It's because everywhere in our lives, our modern lives, we have the same exact problem where, you know, the... We're told or we're taught to be loyal to systems and ideas and organizations instead of real people. Real people, you know, with blood and flesh. Flesh and blood people. Your people. People you see and talk to face to face. Real people. Don't be loyal to capitalism. Don't be loyal to democracy. Don't be loyal to Marxism. Don't be loyal to any ism. Be loyal to people, real people, your people. What I mean, what I mean by your people, the people you love and care for the most in your life, the real people. All these systems and organizations we create, we just, they're just tools, right? We, we create them hoping to help our people, to make our people's lives happier and better. And if they work, if they do make our people's lives happier and better, great. Well, then they're useful tools. But don't worship the tool. Don't be loyal to the tool. You're loyal to the people. It's the real people, right? We're human beings, right? Living human beings, that's what's important. Anytime a system, policies, rules, whatever, anytime it no longer helps or serves your people, destroy it, leave it, or replace it. It's just a tool. This is why I say, leave the schools, homeschool. This is my advice for anyone who really cares about education. If For children, homeschool, homeschool, just leave. You don't have to, I, I don't think you, you have to attack and destroy the schools or do anything like that. Uh, you don't need to m try to open your own school, some big business. That's difficult. You could, but you don't have to. Really, all you have to do is leave. Just take your children out and teach them at home. It's actually quite simple. I'll do some more shows about it. If, if people ask me on social media about how to do homeschooling, then I'll talk more about some details. 
I've got. There are many ways to do it, okay? That's the great thing about homeschooling. There are many, many, many ways to do it that, so you can find a way that fits you and your family and your children. In fact, you can even have different systems um, of homeschooling for each of your children, because each of your children might be different. They have different personalities, different strong points, different weak points, different interests. So, you know, one child, you might use one homeschooling system, maybe something very organized. And maybe another child doesn't need that so much, so you use something more flexible. That's what I love about homeschooling, because it really is focused on the child, okay? People. It's focused on the child. The child is what's important. Not on some system. You can you choose the system to fit the child. If your child really needs, you know, a lot of very organized, planned work and lots of uh, exercises and tons of repetition, great. Well, then you find a system. There are many out there, and or you can even create one yourself. But you 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 find a system that fits what your child needs. Your the system is serving your child. And if you have another child who's maybe very motivated, right? They're very proactive, very independent. And they they don't like all that. They don't they don't wanna they don't wanna be told what to do so much because they have they're very enthusiastic, they're very interested, they're very motivated. So they'll go and they'll get books and they'll read and research themselves, but you don't have to tell them everything. So that kind of child, you wanna give them a lot more uh, flexibility and freedom to explore. You, you might, of course, you'll have some organization, but, but probably much, much less and much different than that first child. So you use a different system, a different approach, a different strategy with your second child because they are different. The system serves the child. You find a system to fit them that helps them. They are what's important. The child is what's important. The student is what's important in education, not the system. Ah, you'll see teachers like, let's say, learning to read, and you'll see people arguing about, you know, phonics is one method of doing it. Um, there's basic phonics, and there's just a, a really huge, big, kind of a very complicated system of phonics. And then there's something called, um, you know, whole word. And I, there, there's there's lots of different approaches to teaching Uh, I'm talking about English specifically, teaching a kid to read, a child to read. And people argue, argue, and argue about it, but you know what? Just, the truth is, I think some kids do better with one system and some kids might do better with another. So I learned, uh, I think most kids uh, probably start them with, I think generally for most kids, you start them with basic phonics, just basic, the main sounds of the letters and a few of the... common combinations and then you start adding in some whole word stuff I think that generally works but you might find one child might really you know improve very fast by focusing a lot on the whole word type of strategy and another child might want to do keep doing more of the complicated phonics stuff so fine, you know, you just play around, test it, see what, see what's working with them, and then you know, the system serves the child. But what we have in education instead, you'll just even in homeschooling, I see this where parents or uh, teachers they become like a like a loyal fanatic for just one system you know no phonics is the only way phonics 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 and then they just push phonics on every single kid this is the problem with school systems right because a school system is a big bureaucracy so they they're they're not going to fit their teaching to each individual child no it doesn't matter they have 30 or 40 kids in a class every kid gets the same exact teaching method the same system. The system is what's important to them. And then the kids have to fit inside it. That's not human. That's anti-human. The system, this machine, becomes the master. And then we, as the real human beings, the living human beings, the children, and even the teachers, because they also don't have a choice, usually, they're just like part of this machine serving it like 
<laughs> like gasoline or something. You see the difference? You see the difference? That's why even effortless English, you know, I, of course, I love effortless English. I believe effortless English is the best system for independent learners to learn English. Absolutely. I 100% very confidently believe that because of the success of so many effortless English members. I do believe it is the best for most people. However, However, if someone comes to me, if they say, AJ, it doesn't work for me, or I don't like it, and I really love memorizing grammar rules, and you know that works for me, then fine. I, I, I don't get upset about that. I'll say, well, you know, it's fine. Maybe if, if that old system works for you, fine. Use it. Use what works. You know, you are the important person. You're the real human being with the goal of speaking English and learning English. So, do what's best for you. That's why I just tell people, try effortless English. Just commit to effortless English for six months. Really put all your energy and time and effort and commit for six months and then see the result. See the result. Compare the result to the old methods you used in schools and you know, conversation schools and all that stuff. The old ways, the kind of traditional old ways. I shouldn't say traditional because really it's just the school way, (laughs) right? You know what I mean. You compare the results. Six months of effortless English compared to six years of school. And what happens is most people say, wow, when if they really do it, they really follow effortless English. When they do that, they realize, wow, I improved in six months. I improved so fast compared to that old school way. But, you know, again, it's people that are important. People. You. That's why I say, you know, it's you. (laughs) It's the same, you know, without, without you, my teaching would be meaningless. Right? You, real, real person, human being. So in your life, it's always good to remind yourself of this because I don't know, for some reason, we're easily tricked. We easily forget this sometimes. And in our modern world, I think we're, we're so... The systems, maybe part of the problem is just size. Our populations are so big. Our towns and our cities are so big. Our schools are so big. Everything, that it's, it's big and yet we don't have close connections with people like a family. So we're just part of these machines, right? These, we go to work and we're part of this machine, this bureaucracy, this system. You go to school, you're part of this machine, this system. You are serving it. None of these systems are serving you as a human being. None of them really care about your individual needs or wants or who you are inside. They don't care about your virtue or your character. They're just part of the machine. So it's really good in life, in all different parts of your life, to ask yourself the question, who are my people? Who are my people? Think about that. Who are your people? And again, what do I mean? You can think about this in two ways. Who are your people? Number one, your people means the people you care most about. The ones you love and truly care for. The ones you would sacrifice for. For most people, that is your family. Maybe some, a few close friends. So that's one version of your people. Another version, a much bigger version of your people might be your community or even your nation. We're also your people and you would like to help and serve them. Or maybe your people includes uh, something a little at a smaller level, you know, big. So your family, that's the closest. And then maybe at the next level, it's some other group or team that you belong to that's meaningful to you. Uh, So it might be your job. 
people you work with, especially if you really, really love your career or maybe you own your own business, especially in that situation, something like that. Well, then that business and your employees and the team, might you might also call that your people. But again, right, it's the people, it's the actual people. If you have a business, also, of course, your customers would be part of your people at that bigger level. But it's good just to think about that and then, you know, imagine them, see them, see their faces in your mind. The real people, right? Not, not, the, not the titles, not their titles, not their positions, just them as human beings. And remind yourself that you are loyal, L-O-Y-A-L, loyal, nice word. You are loyal to them, not to the company, some company name, not to an idea, but to these real people. That's who you are loyal to. That's who you are trying to help. That's who you are serving. That's who you are contributing to. That's who you are working with, connected to, like or love. It's the real people. Then, after you think about this, you think about these people, both your close inner circle and the others, ask yourself, am I, or are we, really serving them, the human beings? Or are we forgetting that? Are we too focused on the rules? Are we too focused on the system? For example, again, if you have a business, I would encourage you to very much do this thinking about your customers like if you're if you have a customer has a complaint do they have to do you have a whole lot of rules right if can, can one can your employee just help them immediately and just make a decision to help them or does your employee have to say well i don't know uh, i have to talk to the manager and and then all these different rules and it's a big hassle and a big problem which is actually making your customer service worse right is your, in your family, same thing. You probably have rules for your children. You have rules and thing, ways of doing things in your family. And um, it's good to look at these sometimes. Because, right, you, the, the kids grow up, for example, as you're getting, have you have kids. So this, the rules you had when they were young, when they were four years old, well, maybe when they're six, uh, you know, maybe some of those rules don't serve them anymore. Maybe those rules are no longer helping them. Maybe you need to change them. And certainly but when they become 12 or 14 or 16, right, you have to, you got to start adjusting, adjusting, adjusting. And it's good to, again, to think, okay, it's, don't get too um, loyal or too uh, attached to specific rules and ideas, systems. Be flexible. And be flexible enough, even in your family, to maybe you have uh, different rules for different kids. You know, if one child is very, very responsible and is a very good decision maker, and another one is not yet, well, maybe the one that's responsible deserves to have a bit more freedom. They've earned it. You know, maybe, so in that situation, maybe it's actually not best to have the same rule for everybody. You might... Just say, hey, you know what? You have earned more freedom. You get a different rule. You have, and then for the other child, second child, you say, you haven't yet, and this is why, and so you still have the other rule. Anyway, I think most parents figure this out themselves. At, the nice thing I see with small groups like families is we usually understand this, right? We usually figure this out. But as the groups get larger, people forget. Like I said, you see this so much with like government or economic systems as, as, as things get very, very big, very, very abstract. You know, people, for example, democracy, they'll act like democracy is God. Democracy, you see this in the media. 
democracy. Why do they do that? Well, because the democracies are totally corrupt. The democracies are destroying their countries and their people. But they try to make people say, well, we can't change anything because democracy is what's important, not the people. You know, for example, we're seeing in several countries around the world, where people are trying to protest now, where these democracies are opening their borders and letting in huge numbers of foreigners. And the foreigners come in. Why do they do it? The foreigners come in and vote. And they vote against the local people. So the democracy is destroying the people, destroying the nation, destroying their history, destroying who they are completely. Well, in that case, forget democracy. The people should change the system, do whatever they need to do to serve their own people. And if that means changing democracy and getting rid of democracy, then you get rid of democracy. If, it, if it's a king doing it, well, then you get rid of the king. Don't be loyal to systems and ideas. Be loyal to people, your people. The people are what's important. Real human beings. I think this is one reason, one reason why when we look at history, when we look at like Mao's China uh, or the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, you know, places where they murdered their own people. I was just reading about this, you know, how in China, the children, they, they, they would get the children to accuse, right, to... to tell the government about their own parents so their own, the children would get their own parents killed why for the idea for the idea of marxism communism that's just evil that's pure evil and so people will do great evil when they get confused about this it's possible that people might do great evil when they start to put these ideas and systems above actual real people. Imagine doing that. Imagine having your own parents killed because they didn't believe enough in communism or Marxism. That's horrible. So real people. Now, this connects to um, this topic that we're moving into with the book now, interdependence, right? We had independence, interdependence. I find this one interesting. Stephen Covey is, uh, was, he's not alive now, but uh, was an American. Of course, I'm an American. And for Americans, you know, this is a big one. This is one of our values for, that we were raised on, right? Individualism, independence. We're the... You know, we're the country of pioneers, right? Our country was built by these independent people who came over from Europe to the wilderness and they fought against the Indians and the wild animals and rah, these strong, independent individuals, right? The cowboys, those kind of people. <laughs> It sounds funny, but actually, I mean, it really is a strong part of American um, heritage, our, our culture. It's one of our big, big, big values. You know, this is one of the reasons why Americans, uh, still, there's a, a good group of Americans who just hate, hate, hate government of all kinds. Uh, I'm probably close to that. <laughs> just part of who we are. But, as I was talking about before, and I'm glad Stephen Covey is talking about it in his book, it can be used against us. You know, I think people just understood in the past, everybody understood that, yes, okay, be independent, but you you have to also have a group. Right? I mean, those big individuals. I look again at my family history. The first uh, person from my family came over from Scotland to America. <clears throat> the 1600s and he had uh, I think it was 11 children <laughs> 11 wow so he had 11 children so was he a, a strong individual he was he left he left his family in Scotland you know got on a boat got on a ship by himself that's very independent for sure 
So that, that's strong, and, you know, I admire it. That's the kind of person that helped to create America. And he hadn't, you know, came over with nothing, and then he built, you know, had this huge family and built these all these big farms, and uh, it was quite amazing, actually. But, you know, he was an individual, strong individual, but he also was interdependent, right? He had all these children and then they grew up and then of course he had even more grandchildren so he's part of this huge 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 group eventually so this is the thing we must realize that that we we need both in general in life teams beat individuals in not everything but in many things there are some areas, I think, where individuals actually do better than teams. Some uh, artistic areas, for example. For example, with music, right? Uh, Beethoven, <laughs> when you have someone like Beethoven, he did better as an individual. If you had a group of people trying to write music, they would not do as well. They would not make anything as good as Beethoven or Mozart or something. So there are some areas, especially in the creative areas of life, innovation, where individuals actually perform best, where you don't want groups, actually. It's actually better to have an individual and work alone. But in a lot of areas of life, especially areas that require uh, competition, it's the opposite. Teams do much better than individuals. We see sports, again, is the obvious example. All right? Teams beat individuals. One soccer player is not going to beat 11. If you have 11 on one side and one on the other, the, 11, the team with 11 is going to win. Even if the one person is a professional even a very top professional, I, I don't know, but I guess I would think, would still have a hard time against 11 people if they were even half good. That's just, it's too overwhelming. In businesses, we certainly see this, that, you know, these gigantic companies, even though their customer service isn't as good, even though they have lots and lots of problems, still they generally will beat the smaller companies. I mean, most of it's because they have so much more money. But, you know, in general, teams beat individuals. It's very difficult to run a large business all by yourself. If you want a solo business, the size is limited. Doesn't mean it's bad. You know, I basically run a solo business, but it limits the size of my business. I've chosen it that because... I don't want to deal with a large organization, but it does limit the size. In politics, in politics, absolutely. Who wins power? Who controls the government? The one that has the biggest and strongest team or group, right? The one that is the best at organizing large groups of people. In war, Again, same thing, right? One individual soldier with a gun is not going to win a war. You need teams. Without a team, in much of life, you are weak. You're isolated. You're alone. In the far past, <laughs> when life was less comfortable, uh, you, you probably would die. You probably would die if you were alone, right? This is why and you can read about um, some of some cultures, the punishment for doing something bad, real, something really bad, like killing somebody, was just banishment. They kicked you out. They just kicked you out of the group. You had to leave their, the town. You had to leave their, the nation or leave the area, and you're all by yourself. And you had to try to survive in the wilderness completely alone, very, very, very tough to do before our modern technology and way of life. You need people. So you want to be independent, but 
for the purpose of serving the group. Right? They're in they're they're connected, these two. They help each other. Right? They're not opposites, they're actually connected. Stephen Covey in the book talks about three, you know, independence, dependence, and interdependence. It's dependence, how he describes dependence basically means you're weak. It basically means you're useless. Useless to the group. Independence, as he's describing it, independence means you you can take care of yourself generally. Not completely, because you still need other people. We all do. But generally, you know, you can take care of yourself at a basic level. And also, most importantly, you can contribute to the group. You have something to add because you're independent, because you're strong, because you have skills. You're useful to the group. Dependent people, they add nothing to the group. They only take. They just take, 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 take. Now, for, you know, like really small children, we expect that. It's okay. We take care of them, but as they grow up, they become more independent. But someone who's 30 years old and they're still completely dependent, now that's a big problem. Now they are not helping the group. They're just taking, taking, taking. They've become kind of a parasite. That's dependence, and uh, yeah, it's quite negative, and I think almost every people around the world in all different situations, nobody likes it, nobody respects it, and nobody wants it. So again, being independent, it does not mean, does not mean that you are 100% independent, you can do everything by yourself, you need no one. No, 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 no. It just means generally you can take care of yourself, normal life survival, normal life things, right? You can pay your bills, you can get your own food, all the basic things we need now in life. And also, you have some kind of useful skill or ability or something to help the group. The group might be your family, the group might be, you know, your company or your job, might be your country, whatever. So you, you don't have to do everything. And, you know, even someone, let's say someone's in a wheelchair. They, they can't walk. Does that mean now they, that they can't be independent, that they can't be part of a group? No, of course not. They still have their mind. So they, you know, and often they usually do contribute with their mind. They have other skills that are useful to the group. So they're still independent. They, can, they learn how to take care of themselves and deal with this physical problem they have. And then they develop other skills that are useful to a group, useful to their families, useful to their communities, useful to their companies, whatever. So that's independence and interdependence. But you need a group. You've got to have a group. And you've got to contribute to the group. Right? You have to add something, not just take. And what's great is that these two actually kind of, um, they kind of help each other. When you join a group, it would actually will kind of put a little pressure. If you really care about the group, you're really loyal, you really want to help the group. This creates a kind of mental pressure to improve yourself. Right? Again, I'll use sports because it's very obvious. Let's say you're a soccer player. Again, a soccer team. So you join a soccer team and you're kind of so-so. You're not very good. You're not terrible, but you're okay. You're so-so. Right? And, you know, but you, you really want to help the team. You want, So, you suddenly, when you join the team, you, you find that you'll get more motivated to improve. You'll get more motivated to practice. Because you're not doing it just for yourself now. You're also doing it to contribute to the team, to be part of the team. And you work hard and you work hard. You go to all the practices and you really, really try hard and you get better. Maybe not great still, but you get better. So you contribute more to the team. And because of that, everyone else, all your teammates, everyone else, they notice, they see, they notice that you're trying hard. They notice you practice hard. They notice you're improving. They notice you're doing your best to contribute to the group. 
Even if you're not the superstar, doesn't matter. You will be respected. They will respect you. They will value you. They will welcome you as part of the team. So you will get that connection, that belonging. And when you feel that, again, it will make your motivation to help the team even stronger. So you're probably going to work even harder and try even harder to improve individually, improve your individual skills, right? So you can see how they can actually make each other better and better and better. You can become more independent, meaning more skillful as an individual, And at the same time, becoming more interdependent, meaning more helpful to the team, the group, your people. It's another one of those magical upward spirals, positive spirals, right? Where one thing makes another thing better, and then that makes the other thing better, and you just get everything just keeps getting better, 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 up and up and up and up and up. That's what independence and interdependence do being a strong individual and also a great team member both you know, so we can think about this we, we sports we can think of lots and lots of examples of this you know michael jordan great individual player fantastic but he needed a team and he was also really good as a teammate he made his whole team better But also on his team, there were guys who were nothing like Michael Jordan. They were not close to as good as him, but they were still useful and important parts of the team. Steve Kerr, he's a coach now. He was on Michael Jordan's team. Not as good as Michael Jordan, of course not, but, you know, still good. And he worked hard as an individual player to do his best, so he was a respected part of that team. He was independent and a very skillful as an individual and also and maybe even more importantly for him he was an important part of the team you are people people so don't get lost in ideas and systems Don't get lost in bureaucracies and rules and structures. Don't forget that it's the people, your people, that are important. It's your people that you serve. It's your people that are on your team. It's your people you want to make happy. You contribute to your people. Help them to be happier. Help them to be more successful. The systems must serve the real people. Commit to my VIP program at EffortlessEnglishClub.com EffortlessEnglishClub.com Go now, commit, commit, commit to my VIP program at EffortlessEnglishClub.com EnglishClub.com. Go to my website now.